and that can edit out any dead air beforehand. I am joined yet again by the incredible, uh, and I want to address you by your proper, complete title, Father, the amazing Reverend Dr. Pacwa. Father Pacwa, yeah, because you deserve that title because you've done an incredible work, Father. You're one of the best there is. Um, I tell people a lot of the times, people will ask me, um, they ask me a lot, and I'll tell them, uh, one of my main inspirations for debating is Father Pacwa. He doesn't do it anymore because he wiped out the whole field, but he's an incredible <laughs> debater. <laughs> Love picking your brain, Father. Thank you for joining me again. Father, how have you been? Oh, I'm for my usual spit and vinegar. <laughs> you've been, you've been, uh, you've been doing well. Uh, you've been doing great there over there at EW10, and you're. Uh, uh, let me ask you before we dive into our Mariology show tonight. Uh, have you been? Uh, you working on any anything new? Maybe a new book or something? I I am. I'm uh, working on a book right now uh, comparing the history of Israel. Wow. With the history of Rome. Mm. Wow. So that's that's um, that's what I'm working on, and it's been pretty much fun. I'm um, uh, Ignatius Press wants to publish this, and it's uh, going to be, um, you know, uh, very much trying to. Um, take a look at uh, uh, the contrast and my basic theme is going to be that the um, uh, basically that Rome and Israel came into contact with each other okay, wow. and Rome basically took over Israel Mm -hmm. And then in 70 and in 135 AD, tried to destroy Israel. And then basically Israel conquers Rome through the, um, the, the whole process of the, um, uh, you know, the, the conversion of the Roman Empire wow. to Christianity. So that's that's going to be any idea when that will be out. What's that? Any idea when that will be out? Yeah, uh, that's what my publisher wants to know. It's <laughs> he says the problem with working with scholars is that they want to include everything, and these books get too big, you know. So, but right now I'm I'm going through um, uh, the uh, period of the conquest of Canaan under joshua wow that's incredible and explaining that in the context of the collapse of the late bronze age period that all the civilizations in the late bronze age were in thorough collapse yeah. and israel is one of the few that is ascendant yeah so you know all the others were falling apart and the Trojan War took place during the time of Joshua. Right. And a lot of folks don't realize it, but that's part of, you know, the uh, whole collapse. The whole Mycenaean mm. culture collapsed. The Hittite culture collapsed. The Assyrian culture was breaking apart. The Kassite dynasty of Babylon uh, was destroyed. Yeah. Um, Egypt was moving in towards chaos and weakness. I said, just a lot of problems. A ton of problems. Now, the topic we're talking about today is one of the most incredibly important ones in our Catholic tradition, our Catholic faith, Mariology. Father, let me ask you first off, why is Mariology even important? Why is uh, talking about any of the Marian dogmas, why, why are they important? You don't have jesus christ without mary god the son existed in all eternity no beginning and no end but the incarnation occurs in the womb of a specific woman mm -hmm. the virgin mary of nazareth and you got to 
deal with that. It's, it's because it's not just, uh, and this is a temptation even among some Christians, and yep. certainly in the world, is to think that this was almost like God renting a uterus. Yeah, okay, we, uh, let me let me uh, get conceived in a uterus and um, then get out of the way. That didn't happen. Yeah. The conception of God the Word by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit is itself a tremendous act of salvation. St. John makes as a highlighted statement in the uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh. And in fact, at the um, place where, you know, uh, at Mary's home in Nazareth, there's a, it's now a church, of course. And at the place of the incarnation, the annunciation, because when the it's an annunciation by the angel. Yep. And it's the incarnation of God the Son. And you know the in his conception right then and there. And it says at the base of the altar, hic verbum carum factum est. Here the word was made flesh. Incredible. It's, you know, and you, you, you when, when you see that, when you read it, uh, and you say, you know, this is an awesome place to be. I've been blessed any number of times to celebrate Holy Mass right there. Wow. And, you know, to say, this is my body at the place where it became his body. Yeah in the incarnation and this is so that's very important and but it's not only that saving act of the incarnation that took place in her womb but her role continues throughout yeah not only does she carry the christ child and give birth but we see that at his presentation in the temple, Simeon speaks to her. Now, uh, people who don't know the Middle East miss some of the importance of this. Because in general, a strange man, that is by stranger, I mean someone who is not part of your family, such a man generally does not initiate a conversation with a wife, but with a husband. This is a proper order in Middle Eastern culture. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, for Simeon not to address St. Joseph, doesn't even speak to him. Right. But he holds the child and says to his mother, that a, uh, this child is set for the rise and the fall of many. A very important verse, because that verse sets the theme for the rest of the gospel. People either fall into disbelief or they rise in faith. And you see in scene after scene, the woman washes Jesus' feet with her tears and dries him with her hair. The yeah. Pharisees judge him. The um, lawyers criticize him at table, but the people love him. And the uh, sometimes the Pharisees will accuse him of blasphemy as when he forgives the sins of the paralytic who had been let through the roof, while the crowd says, we've never seen anything like this. They're amazed. These, you know, it's the rise and fall. Some of the Pharisees criticized Jesus. 
when he calls Matthew. Matthew finds salvation and his call to be an apostle. While these unknown scribes and Pharisees have to walk away because he's eating with sinners and we don't tolerate that. These, this is what we mean by rise and fall, and it sets a theme. Secondly, Simeon speaks to her directly yeah. and says, a sword will pierce your heart so that the inner thoughts of many might be made known. This also states that she has a role in this, a role of suffering with Christ. Yeah. But at the same time, a suffering that will help people know their inner thoughts. And that's no small issue. Think about how many thousands of dollars some people spend lying on a couch in a psychologist's office in order to find out the inner workings of their thoughts and their mind. Her suffering is going to be something that helps people to do that. That's an important role. Yeah. And we can we can go into other aspects of the role, but the other culmination point is when that sword pierces her heart, namely at that most poignant moment of standing at the cross. Yeah. Now I don't know. I didn't never didn't remember if you have children or not. Mm -hmm. One little girl. One little girl. Yeah. And you know, it's been the most painful part of my priesthood to be with parents who lost a child. Oh goodness! Like, I cannot. Um, I cannot imagine. I can only. Um, I can only say that I. Um, I have seen with my own eyes uh, the passing of my own uh, brother and how it affected my mother. How I would yeah, not wish that exactly. upon anyone. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And. At the cross, when mm. her heart is pierced with this yeah. worst of pains, then you see that Jesus says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. He entrusts, and, and it's important that he says that to the beloved disciple. Doesn't say John's name. Right. It says the, the beloved disciple because he's entrusting every beloved disciple to her. Mm. And he's entrusting her to every beloved disciple. Yeah. And this will be part of that suffering that she endures, that sword piercing her heart to help us have our own inner thoughts revealed that's very key and there's one other thing too i'd like to in terms of what's basic mm -hmm. in mariology the whole issue comes from the fact that adam and eve sinned right they disobeyed god by mm -hmm. eating the fruit of the tree of yeah. the knowledge of good and evil. They fell for Satan's trick. Yep. And when the Lord God walks in the garden, he asks, where are you? That's the first question he, God poses in the Bible. And it, it what Archbishop Sheen used to say, that question sets the theme for the whole bible yeah philosophy is about man's search for god the bible is about god's search for man mm -hmm. he's asking where we are yeah. and in that uh adam admits i was hiding why are you hiding? Who told you you're naked? And he said, well, the woman whom you put here told me to eat the fruit because God 
the Lord God knows, of course, and said, did you eat of the fruit? I said, well, the woman, and you put her here. It's <laughs> kind of your fault too, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, why did you do this? I said, well, the serpent tricked me. Serpent has nowhere to go. So the serpent then is cursed. God doesn't even ask him a question. He, and in the curse of the serpent, we see the first hope for redemption. Oh, yeah. Because it says that, you know, you'll crawl on your belly and all this. And it's interesting, in about 92, I think it was, or 93, Israelis found a fossil of a snake that has legs. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a fossil they found because Israel has lots of limestone, a lot of fossils yeah. in there. And uh, they found, you can look it up online, uh, the uh, snake with legs. Very interesting fossil. Anyway, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now, a lot of the modern translations say between your descendants and his, her descendants. That's not what it says. Mm -hmm. It says between your seed and her seed. What's the problem with that? Do you see a problem with that? Very clearly, uh, women don't have seed. Bingo. Yep. This, the seed always refers to the contribution of a man yep. to the conception of a child. In fact, the, the word sperm mm -hmm. is a Greek word meaning seed. Yep. So that's, uh, and, and that's what you see in the Greek translation. How does a woman have seed? And the answer to that, no, this was a question people didn't dare raise yeah. in the Old Testament. And I don't know of it being raised among the rabbis. Mm -hmm. But the answer to it is in the incarnation when a virgin conceives. And uh, we, would we might say from our modern perspective, all of Jesus' DNA comes from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yeah, no doubt. And this is the one time that it's the seed of a woman where Jesus is conceived virginally. This makes her the fulfillment of the promise of redemption back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and 16 now let me let me ask you this father because that incredible points you you've brought up there now <clears throat> i think of genesis 3 and 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 the verse that also talks about that enmity between the woman and her seed and i'm reminded of the incredibly profound words in 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 ephibilus, in ephibilus deus from pope pius the ninth and how he hearkens to those great fathers of old how they view that enmity that is between the serpent, uh, between the serpent and the woman, and the seed of the woman, and they note how that enmity uh, is the very same enmity that is there between the serpent and the seed and the woman. So thus, many fathers concluded that just like Christ was completely sinless and never under the dominion of the devil, right. thus the mother as well would never be in the clutches under the in the dominion of the devil because that is what original sin is yes under the dominion of the devil so biblically we've got a very clear case for the immaculate creation of holy mary that, not make a conception a creation immaculate conception yeah my bad my, i meant to say yeah. uh conception i'm sorry yeah immaculate uh conception of holy mary that she's uh, free of original sin yes which is an incredibly biblically bible based and patristic base would that be fair to say that it's very uh very clear if you look at uh because i've only examined the greek uh, but you say the greek pretty much lines up with uh with the original yeah, greek as well yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Incredible. And let me add one other thing about her immaculate conception. Yeah. And that is in the greeting of Elizabeth, we remember when right after the conception of Christ in her womb and people who are, uh, you know, are, have given birth to children mm -hmm. don't know the exact moment of the conception. Right. And it, after a man and woman are intimate, the process of conception takes place sometime later. Mm -hmm. This is something that um, Alice von Hildebrand used to talk about how a woman's womb is the last place where God creates. Mm. All, of, all of the universe is created and we don't, nothing new in the form of matter is created anywhere. But in the womb of a woman, God creates a soul. And this is one of the reasons for the uh, true holiness and specialness of a woman's womb, yeah. which is very much under assault these days. Oh, man. But uh, this is a, a very important point. And then after that conception, still, there's nothing that she would feel, but she acts on faith mm. that the child is conceived and travels for 70 miles by foot and donkey yeah. to her kinswoman, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth gives her three beatitudes. The first is, blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mm -hmm. And blessed is she who believed what the Lord spoke to her. Three beatitudes, all of which are very important. The yeah. first beatitude is key for understanding the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. The phrase, blessed are you among women, is not particularly good Greek idiom, <laughs> but it is very fine quality Aramaic and Hebrew idiom. The... Uh, and it's a little geeky conversation, but it gets to a point, if you'll be uh, bear with me. Mm -hmm. In Semitic languages, like Hebrew and Aramaic, they don't have the comparative or the superlative. Right. So how do they communicate that someone is better? They'll say, Ata tov mimenu. You are good from him. Mm. They'll use the preposition to indicate better. You are good from him is their idiom for saying you're better than he is. That would be our English expression. Mm -hmm. Whereas to say you mm. are the best man there, they would say, Ata tov bain hum. You are good among them. Mm -hmm. When the Elizabeth, note, not by her own wits, right, but under the influence of, and, uh, of the Holy Spirit speaking through her, says, blessed are you among women. That is Aramaic idiom for saying you are the most blessed woman. Yep. Now there's a similar phrase in the book of Judith, blessed are you among women on earth. Yeah. That only applies to her blessedness among the women alive at her time. Elizabeth gives a more absolute statement. Blessed are you among women, period. She is more blessed than all women, including our mother Eve. Yeah. <clears throat> How is she more blessed than Eve? By being conceived without original sin, but unlike Eve, never falling into it. Yeah. That makes her more blessed than Eve. 
and of course any other woman and we men are not even in the running <laughs> yeah and father i all you know one thing that i always hear that blows me away i always hear well there in the catholic church you all are anti-women you all don't like women really the greatest of God's creation <laughs> is a woman. And we yes. believe her, uh, we venerate her, we love her, we call her our Holy Mother Mary, our right. Mother Mary. Right. I, I think that people really don't know what they're talking about because Holy Mary, as you pointed out, plays an incredibly vital role in our faith. The early church fathers saw it, and as you pointed out before, who are these early fathers? Those that were taught and trained by the apostles and their disciples that taught and trained in an unbroken line in apostolic succession. They viewed this incredible woman in a very significant manner. Let me ask you that other, the other thing, Father, the, the greeting when the angel uh, Gabriel greets Mary as um, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Greek, and I'm going to butcher it, uh, no, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, good. Too many. there we go. Now, let me ask you this. Um, is uh, is there any significance to that greeting? Or is it just been any kind of regular greeting? Yeah, you know, A, again, here I go into geek mode. <laughs> Greek geek mode. Yep. Um, it is a perfect passive participle feminine singular yep you that know it by memory well. Well. what's that you know it by memory very well yeah, yeah. Well, that's what i do for a living that's what geeks do <laughs> <laughs> but it's it it means that she who has been graced mm -hmm. now this is important because neither the blessed virgin mary nor anybody in the church claims that this is a, a being born without original sin right. is something she accomplished by herself. None of us accomplishes getting born by ourselves. This is not something we choose. We're chosen to live. And this is a great blessing. But here, it's not only that she didn't make herself get conceived, but she's been graced and this is not some attempt to schmooze her so as to get a yes out of her angels don't schmooze right <laughs> politicians are schmooze not angels business people schmooze angels don't even that doesn't even make sense to them Let they me say exactly what god has commanded they are absolutely faithful to what god intends them to say and to say that she has been graced you know sets her apart and secondly that the lord is with you yeah that presence of grace and the lord's presence in her is possible because sin is not present let me ask you this, Father, because the, the way you broke that down was incredibly profound. Now, you're talking about in Luke 1, Luke 1, 28, the angel greets Mary that way. Now, let me, let me walk the audience through this. This is <clears throat> before Holy Mary says, let it be done to me according to thy word. This is before that. This is before the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost, isn't it? Now... What you're telling me is that according to the Greek of Luke, chapter 1, Mary was already in possession of this kind of grace before the angel even arrived. Yeah, that's right. That is incredible. That's, that, that's what he takes for granted. Yeah. This is his working assumption as given to him by God. Again, it's not that the angel wants to make a good impression. Yeah, angels don't care. They say what's true because God told them the truth, and they say what is true. It's their nature, um, as opposed to the demons who only understand lies and deception. Yeah. So, um, so he's saying exactly, and then he goes on 
to explain that she will bear a son and that he will sit on the throne of his father, David. And, you know, something about that announcement, a lot of us don't think about. But the only time Our Lady saw her son proclaimed as king in a public way was on the cross. Wow. Where the sign said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I'm, I guarantee you, she did not have in her mind the idea that, oh yeah, he'll be, he'll be enthroned on a cross. Won't that be nice? No, no. She, I'm sure in her mind, she thought it was going to be an enthronement like David in a palace. Yeah. That's where you, you know, he said he'll sit on the throne of his father, David, that's being a palace. It is on a cross. But it's also a reversal of the the sin in the Garden of Eden. If you notice, St. John brings out what archaeologists have confirmed, that he was crucified in a place that was a garden. And in the first century soil level, they find lots of seeds and pollen from lots of flowers. It was, it was a garden. Yeah, wow. And so he's on this new tree of life, as opposed to the tree with the serpent hanging on it to tempt, to disobey God. And instead of the old Adam and the new, uh, and the old Eve, it's Christ the new Adam. And as St. Irenaeus points out, Mary the new Eve that's standing at this new tree. It's the opposite view. It's like a mirror of the sin in the redemption. And that's a very powerful thing. But I just think about that. Every time I remember that verse, that he will sit on the throne of his father, David, um, you say, wow, she just saw that on the cross. And yet stayed firm. Yeah. Now that's faith. And that, you know, in one sense is the faith that undergird uh, Elizabeth's third beatitude. Blessed is she who believed all that the Lord spoke to her. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a very powerful element of her, you know, role in the faith life of the church. Now, the one thing that I frequently hear, Father, and I hear it from our evangelical friends, would be that, well, you all give a lot of honor to Mary. Um, why, uh, why not focus only on Christ? And, and the one thing that I tend to uh, try to point out to them is that every Marian dogma points to Christ. <laughs> every one of them. You brought it up a little while ago. This is an important point that you brought up, and I think people, even Catholics, tend to forget. The Immaculate Conception is saying so much about Christ because Mary did not. How can you merit to be uh, immaculately conceived? You, you can't. It is by a singular grace. grace. Yes. And it's in hard. fact, that is why in the Magnificat, It begins, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Mm -hmm. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Yeah. And Christ is her Savior. But he saves me, and I assume you, by pulling me out of the sins I commit. Yeah. He saves the Blessed Virgin by having his hand there to protect her from getting into the filth of sin. And you brought that up, point up. I want people to re- realize that you, and I remember when I, when we were on your show, the EWTN show, talking about Mary, you brought up a great point, and you've brought it up many times uh, after and before, how that Greek word for savior doesn't always mean being saved from actual sin. So yeah. uh, our evangelical friends cannot use that particular argument Indeed, that Greek word can be used in various different manners. And as you pointed out, sure. Mary, indeed, 
we don't deny Mary needed a savior, do we, Father? No, 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 no. And, you know, I, I also just want to point out that the word for savior in Hebrew and Aramaic will be a form of Yeshua. Mm. Yesha is the word meaning to save. Wow. Yeshua is savior. Yeah, excuse me. Yo, I'm sorry. Yoshea. I got to get the vowel points. I'm sorry. Uh, Yoshea is savior. That happens to be the name of her son. Wow. Yeah. And see, the, I mentioned before how the expression, blessed are you among women, is good Aramaic. There's, there are a number of things about Luke 1 and 2 that indicates that it's translated from Aramaic. One of them uh, is that, you know, that uh, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It's Jesus, Yeshua, uh, excuse me, Yoshea, a uh, Savior, which is the same roots as Jesus, Yeshua. And so that's one thing okay and then a second thing is in the magnificat you see elizabeth's name upon an elizabeth's name just as in the prayer of zechariah you see his name but it is not his name in the Greek version of it, mm. but it's his name in the Aramaic or Hebrew version. Same thing with Elizabeth. Remember how it said, uh, God satisfies the hungry but sends the rich away empty? Oh, yeah. That would be Eli Shava. Eli Shava is Elizabeth in Aramaic. But it means God satisfies. Yeah. And that pun yeah. on her name only works in the air if it's in Aramaic. <clears throat> and secondly, Ze Zechariah means the Lord remembered. And in his hymn, it says, you have remembered your covenant. So the Lord remembered is part of that. Now, Here's something important too about Our Lady and the the truth of the gospel. Who were the witnesses to the birth and uh, of Jesus and John the Baptist at who were still alive after Jesus' resurrection? It's only Mary. That's right. Yeah. You know, wow. Elizabeth and Zechariah were elderly. They were elderly. That's correct. Yeah. John the Baptist was already dead. He had been executed yeah. by Herod. That's right. Both Elizabeth and Zechariah would have been older as well. Elizabeth right. as well. Yeah. Right. It says in the text that yeah. they were both advanced in years. So the idea that they and and she's well past the time uh, of her, her monthly uh, uh, yeah. experience, and so um, then you, you're talking about they're they're passed away. In fact, it says John was raised in the desert. Yeah, as most likely as an orphan. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and perhaps perhaps by the Essenes, because they used to raise orphans of priestly families. Mm -hmm. That was one of their missions to to raise priests who were or orphaned, and but be that as it may, they're they're gone. There's nobody else around. Yeah. Only Our Lady. She is the source for knowing those two chapters of Luke, and the only source. The rest of the gospel we have apostles and disciples who are alive after the resurrection but for the first two chapters 
Our Lady is the only one there. So she actually helped to write the Bible. That's incredible. And again, those first two chapters are written in a poor quality of Greek, but they translate easily back into Aramaic, which was her language. Mm -hmm. And Luke usually, St. Luke wrote the best Greek in the New Testament. St. Luke and the author of Hebrews are the best Greek. But in these two chapters, his Greek is barbaric. And uh, to add to the audience, I want to let the audience know, you, in my opinion, have probably made one of the best cases that I have heard. Do you still hold to, you have told me personally, you think that Hebrews could even be Lucan? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's that, uh, And that's not my original theory, it's, it's, it's all this, but that's a possibility. Right. Because it's got elements of Paul's thought, but it's not Paul. Doesn't right. read like he wrote at all. Better Greek for one thing. Now, I got to tell you something else too about the role of Mary. I, I'll never ever forget the very first radio show I ever was on. This was back in 1982. I heard an anti-Catholic sermon on a local Protestant radio show. And I complained to the station manager who was the wife of one of my classmates at Vanderbilt University. Wow. So I knew him and her, we were friends. And so I, I was, you know, e easy enough to talk. And she said, I, I wish I could change it, but I can't. And she wasn't Catholic herself, but she didn't like oh. anti-Catholicism. Uh, she wanted to just promote uh, Protestant uh, theology without the anti part. Yeah. Well, she said, I'll tell you what we can do. You can be on our live call-in show and answer questions. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I went and this lady called in and said, how come you Catholics pray to Mary? When I'm sick, I don't go to the doctor's mother. I go to the doctor. <laughs> and I said, well, ma'am, we see that at the conversion of St. Matthew in uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8 and mm -hmm. also in Mark chapter 2, uh, we see that our Lord compares himself to a physician and yeah. that he came to forgive sinners like a doctor heals the sick, not the healthy. But actually, ma'am, that's the only time our Lord compares himself to a doctor. I said, far more often, our blessed Lord compares himself to being the bridegroom of the church. Yep. And he loves the church the way a groom loves his bride. And it's not only in the Gospels, but it's in St. Paul and Ephesians 5. It's yep. all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. And your problem, lady, is that you don't like our mother-in-law. <laughs> and click, she hung up. But here's the point. When you ask about your question earlier, why go to Mary when you, when you have yeah. Jesus? Just go to Jesus. I said, you're married, right? Do you have any in-laws? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in-laws can help make or break a marriage. No doubt. Yep. A good relationship with your in-laws will help your relationship to your spouse. Yep. It can that includes the brothers-in-law and the sisters-in-law no and doubt. the parents-in-law, right? Yep. And that's one of the reasons, you know, a lot of people have big wedding parties so that they can sort of look good. That's mm -hmm. dumb. Have a good time so that your relatives can meet and they can figure out whom they like on the other side <laughs> because they'll be coming back again for baptisms, birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, all this. And so this way you know who whom you like and who you don't. But, You're correct. And so don't worry about 
spend a million dollars on this. Have everybody have a good time so they get along later on as well. Be that as it may. The saints are our in-laws. Yeah. We are in the primary relationship with Jesus Christ, just as you are with your wife. You and your wife are the primary relationship. But you don't exclude the in-laws. You learn a lot from them. And you also can say, well, you know, would you talk to your sister or your daughter or my wife about, you know, how I can do something better? You know, you, you have conversations. You learn a lot about the past and how, what they were like. Um, with some mothers-in-law, you see the future of your wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's not bad for a guy who's not married. And <laughs> you know very well. You've been doing this for a long time. See, you know the ins and outs. <laughs> yeah. And we need to see that our relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary and with the other saints are our in-laws. They're not the primary relationship. Jesus Christ is. He's the Redeemer. But these are going to be, they're going to be up in heaven. These saints are going to be there. And just like your in-laws are going to keep coming back for the baptism, birthdays, and anniversaries, we'll be coming back to heaven yep. and being with these people. It's a good idea to begin that set of love relationships with them now. This yep. is part of the role of the saints. I think it does. Yeah, that, that's a great, great analogy there. And you're, you're, you're correct. I, I think if people were to read the Bible and then supplement that with the way the early church fathers read the scripture, they would realize these are very biblical concepts. And the communion of saints is a very... Now, and, and I like to add, uh, it, it, it comes from ancient Judaism. Uh, the communion of saints, prayer for the dead, intercession. So... This is a very, not only is it, does it come from ancient Judaism, it's ancient Christian. It's apostolic. It's the way I like to put it forth. Uh, the other thing that does, and, and it, unfortunately, it's very popular nowadays, Father, and it's been popular since back when you were debating. So I know you've heard it many times. That is the title of Mary as Teotokos, as, as a God-bearer, as mother of God. Yeah. You hear it so often, Father, and it comes from our evangelical friends. We want to be very nice and, and, and say that, you know, our evangelical friends, and we call them to the fullness of the faith, only found within Catholicism. But they make the claim kind of to downgrade the importance of Holy Mary. They'll say, well, we have no problem with calling Mary the mother of God. That title is a completely Christological title anyway. Right. And let me ask you this, Father. It, would it be fair to say... Look, we're not denying it's a Christological title, but it's also saying something profoundly important about Holy Mary. Uh, would it be fair to say that, Father? Or how would you? Yeah, break yeah, that? no, no. And you know, it's the, 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 there's uh, again, we have so many elements uh, that we have to pay attention to. And as you said, starting off with Scripture, yeah, and not just with our theology and letting the the deep richness of revelation help us engage in that fullness of the the uh, relationship with our, um jesus christ and his mother i mean uh as an example what you're saying when you look at John chapter 2 at the wedding feast of Cana. Yeah. It's the Blessed Virgin who instigates the first miracle. The married couple and their families did not ask Jesus to do a miracle. They right. didn't have enough faith. And the apostles didn't ask it. They didn't have enough faith either. In fact, it says at the end of the wedding that 
when they saw the sign, they began to believe. Mm -hmm. So they were just beginning to believe. But Mary had that faith that this was God the Son. She was told that it was God. Mm -hmm. And she knew her responsibility. But she also knew that she could point a problem to him. She doesn't tell him what to do. Right. She simply says they have no wine. And then she tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I like to, you know, uh, one of the things that Pope St. John Paul introduced was the luminous mysteries, the mm -hmm. mysteries of light. And among these are the wedding feast of Cana, the first miracle, and the transfiguration. At Cana, Jesus' mother says, do whatever he tells you. At the transfiguration, his father says, this is my beloved son, do what he tells you. His father and his mother both tell us to do what he tells us. And this is part of our entering into the relationship. But the Blessed Mary directs us toward doing what he said, but also directs him to respond to a need that she perceived, namely the lack of wine yeah. and not grape juice. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that was real wine. That was definitely alcoholic. I'm, I'm it, it, the, yeah. the word the word that you, just in case anybody gets a little yeah. you know, upset, uh, the word is oinos. Yep. It's the same word that St. Paul says, don't be drunk on oinos. Yep. The same word that they accused Christ of being a, a drunkard on. So right. it's definitely alcoholic. <laughs> definitely oh, yeah. Alcoholic. Now, you... you, you when talking about Mary, very often you refer to her as the Virgin Mary. Now, when we look in early church history, Father, we realize um, that it was, without a doubt, it was a, look, it, let's be very clear, not toe around the line. It was a mark of orthodoxy, of being part of the true church, to believe Holy Mary was ever virgin, was a perpetual virgin. Now, let me then ask you this, Father, because... And we've touched upon it before, but a repetition helps the audiences. And, I, and the way you break it down in particular because of your knowledge of the languages to me is mind-blowing. Why do we call Mary ever virgin? The Bible talks about brothers and sisters. It, can't it, can it only mean an actual brother and sister from the same mother? Why on earth else would they be called brothers and sisters? Brothers? Yes, yes. Well, um, uh <laughs> There's a problem there. Um, you know, we see the brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. other, uh, you know, uh, mentioned by name. Right. Right? If you take a look at St. Mark, mm -hmm. chapter uh, 6. Yeah. In, uh, and also in Matthew 13. Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 55 and 56 Matthew uh, I, I, sorry Matthew 12 55 sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, it says his brothers James and Joseph Simon and Judas mm -hmm. and Mark says James and Joses Judas and Simon same four guys okay yep and here's what's interesting is that Two of the brothers are mentioned again. Yep. Once in Matthew chapter 27, verse 56, where it says, among the people standing at the cross were Mary Magdalene uh -huh. and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And in Mark 15, verse 40, um, uh, looking uh, from afar among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and Joses and Salome. Now this Mary who is the mother of James and Joses, mm -hmm. Jesus brothers, is mentioned also in the Gospel of St. John. Yeah. 
it says in uh, John chapter 19, verse 25, standing by the cross were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary. Yep. So there's this other Mary. There, there are three Marys at the cross. Now, how come so many Marys? Well, that's not to be surprised uh, because Miriam is the way that you say Mary in Hebrew and Aramaic, Mariam, and that was the sister of Moses. Mm -hmm. So that's a very popular name. Still is very popular among yes. Jewish uh, girls. So that's um, that's why it's, it, it's Mary. And so, many, but there are three Marys: Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus' brothers James and Joseph, and Mary the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. One other point is made in John nineteen twenty five that Mary, who is the mother of James and Joseph is also the wife of Clopas. Mm. Now, here's what we know about Clopas. He is mentioned in a later writing by St. Hegesippus. St. Hegesippus was a Jewish convert to you know, the, 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 the Christian faith. And he lived in the second century, and he wrote a book. And in fact, it is quoted. We don't have the whole copy of it. Right. It's been lost. But it was quoted by Eusebius in his history of the church. Mm -hmm. And Hegesippus knew the grandson of the apostle Jude. Yeah. And he learned from him, who's also a family member, that Clopas was Joseph's brother. So Mary, the wife of Clopas, is called Our Lady's sister, as in sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. They don't have that word sister-in-law. Correct. So he's just a sister. But the brothers of Jesus are the children of Clopas and Mary, Clopas being a brother of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. And that is what we normally call a cousin, but they also don't have the word for cousin in Aramaic yeah. or Hebrew. So they just call them brother. Well, usually it's a, it's a very complicated way to express it. When you give it in its formal form, you say, he is the son of my father's brother. Uh, you only say the son of my uncle, but it's the son of my father's brother. And that's a different word than the son of my mother's brother. So, I it, and they they just cut through that and say, he's my brother. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and that's, Arabs still do that. Still among many Arabs, he's my brother. If they know English, they'll tell you he's his cousin. But otherwise, they say he's my brother, and um, the, uh, and if you ask more, than say, yeah, the son of my father's brother. But you know, that's what who these brothers and uh, and sisters of Jesus are. Yeah, they're the children of Mary and Clopas, Clopas being Joseph's brother. That was masterfully laid out, Father, and and I guess what shocks me more than anything else is your amazing memory. I need to drink or eat whatever it is you drink and eat to have that memory off the top of your head. I mean, uh, just blown away. You, you're correct in Hegesippus and everything. I mean, masterfully laid out. Um, I, I guess- I, I, I'm gonna have to, where do you live? Texas. Oh, you can get what I eat down there. Oh yeah. There are plenty walking around. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm a, I'm a big meat eater. <laughs> I'm a big meat eater. We both are. Yeah, no, no doubt. I, in fact, after, after the show, I'm going to get me a nice, delicious steak. Just there you go. That. Yeah. Usually when I get a steak, I butchered it myself. And uh, I'm going to tell the audience so the audience can be jealous. I want to be jealous. I've tasted your amazing uh, home cooking. It is second to none. Incredible from your own hunts 
just amazing. And um, I'm going to have to one of the one of these days drop you a visit again and taste your amazing food because it's incredible, Father. Sure. Your, hunt, your hunts are amazing. Now, my final question to you, Father, would be the bodily assumption of Mary, perhaps one of the most controversial, according to our evangelical friends. But when I look at our um, our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, even our Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters, they don't believe in it. And they don't believe in it because of the Pope. They'll say, hey, this is part of the liturgy. This is built into our faith. In fact, they celebrated the Feast of the Assumption in the East before they celebrated it in the West. That is an incredible point. So yeah. then let me let me ask you this. All of the apostolic churches hold to it, believe it, well before the declaration in the 1900s in yep. Modus Vicentissimus Deus. Is it fair to say the belief in the bodily assumption of Mary, which is incredibly early, that this is a mark of apostolicity when all the ancient churches hold to it, believe yep. it, celebrate it, and it's part of the liturgical life? Would that be fair to say? I would say it's fair. And... Let me point out something. You know, I, I lived in Germany for a while and I was learning the language and I would help out at the U.S. military bases mm. in Nuremberg in Germany, in Bavaria. Right. And I'd ce celebrate mass and baptize and all that. It was, uh, and it was a great privilege. I loved meeting our en enlisted uh, men and their families. Yeah. Um, and as I got to walk around Nuremberg, I went to the Lutheran St. Lawrence Kirche. And yep. at the St. Lawrence Church, Lutheran uh, 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 Evangelical, there is a larger than life size statue of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Wow. That is suspended above the main altar. Wow. <laughs> now, Luther apparently didn't have trouble with that. You know, he ordered that removed from St. Lawrence Kirche. He, he so, didn't. And that's a good point. I want to add that point for the audience um, that I have looked up, I've looked through Luther's sermons. Luther never, ever denied the assumption, rather, he affirmed it. So what's what's going on, Father? With if our modern day evangelical friends, uh, they've abandoned this very well, he, teaching. Here's a way that has helped them understand it. Mm -hmm. They have, presumably, if they're people of faith, mm -hmm. which generally is the case, there are some denominations of the Reformed churches, the the some of the um, older Reformed. Reformation churches, Presbyterian USA and the Episcopalians, where there are real problems of faith anymore. Yeah. And that's why they're they're dwindling. And, and to, they are. To, and there are now about five times as many Jewish people in New York City as Episcopalians in the whole country. Wow. Yeah, you lose faith. You, you you die out. I, I, I've i often described uh, heterodox Catholics, but it applies to unbelieving Protestants too. Mm -hmm. They're spiritual geldings and spays. Yeah. They remove the essentials of their faith and they can't reproduce. Yep. But among evangelicals who are people of faith, they believe in the bodily assumption of the prophet Elijah. Yeah. And in fact, the place of the assumption of Elijah is the site of an ancient church in the kingdom of Jordan. When they uh -huh. made peace with the, the state of Israel back in 94, they started to remove the landmines. <laughs> it's the nice, it's a neighborly thing to do. Right. To get rid of the landmines. Yeah. And they discovered the ruins of the Church of the Assumption of Elijah. Wow. Now, if you have 
the ability to have faith that Elijah was assumed into heaven. And you even sing hymns mm -hmm. based on that, like swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Yeah. That is a model for understanding the assumption of Blessed Mary. No doubt. Now, this, uh, in, in the East, there is a wonderful, that there, there are icons of the Assumption. You know how they depict it? They have the, the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary laid out in death with the apostles gathering around to celebrate her funeral. And then you see our Lord Jesus in heaven above that scene. Yeah holding the Blessed Virgin Mary like a baby in swaddling clothes wow. on his left arm. The reason it's on his left arm is because in the Song of Songs, it says, I rested my head on his left arm. Incredible. I did not know that. Yeah. And this is a, a such a beautiful thing. It really is. Um, and if we can believe that Elijah, who was going around cutting heads off of prophets and things like that, would be assumed into heaven. Yeah. Can you imagine if it was your mother? Would you leave her to rot in My a wife. tomb if your mother, who raised you, and her in her womb, your body took shape, and at her breasts you nursed? And you say, yeah, you rot down there, I'll take. No. no. If our if God can raise Elijah to heaven, how much more would he do for his mother, the woman filled with grace, the woman of faith who believed the word of God, yep. the woman who um, is blessed because she believed, and who got him to do the first miracle, and who stood with him at the cross you'd say yeah just sort of sit there let the worms get you the reunion between them would be most amazing yeah. and you don't have a more profound love than between those two and to not see it complete now there are various descriptions of the assumption mm -hmm. of our lady in the early church yep they are not considered part of scripture the church knows that they were written later and they yep. were not written by the apostles or disciples right so they're not included but we we do have them and this was nobody contradicted it in the early church uh, not until the 16th century yeah and this is uh, something that I think is presaged in Revelation 12. We right. began tonight talking about the enmity between mm -hmm. the serpent and the woman. In Revelation 12, the world comes to its conclusion with enmity between the great serpent, Satan, that's what it says in Revelation 12. Yep. And the woman. And he first wants to eat her child, but he's taken up to heaven. And then he goes after her. And the earth prevents her from being swallowed up. Mm -hmm. And this is seen as the woman who appeared in heaven. And she's clothed with the sun. This isn't exactly the humble virgin of Nazareth, just in the local woolen clothes or something, or linen clothes. But she's clothed with the sun itself and the moon and the stars under her feet. And this great dragon, you know, is when he's cast down to earth by St. Michael and his angels, um, you know, there's rejoicing. Yep. Uh, and I, I think it's very important that, that rejoicing, 
Now is the accuser of our brethren cast down. The word Satan means accuser in Hebrew. And even the Greek word diabolos means prosecuting attorney. And a lot of times, and I've, this is a, not exactly on our topic, but it's very important because I hear silly people saying, well, I'm a recovering Catholic. I'm getting over Catholic guilt. That kind of guilt is the accusation by the evil one. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin to yeah. move us to repentance. The evil spirit accuses us of sin in order to keep us in fear and control us. Not unlike politicians and the way they use fear mm -hmm. to control us. And that's a big conscience. And then after he's cast down, he pursues the woman. And that the, the enmity that began in Genesis 3.16 is now brought to the ultimate victory as Satan is defeated. And Mary is that woman clothed in the sun. Remember, she gives birth to the sun. Yeah. Some people try to say, oh, that's a symbol of the church. Eh, wrong answer. I because agree. Because giving birth to the Messiah was not done by the church. No. The church is born from the side of Christ like E was from the side of Adam when Christ's heart was pierced and blood and water flowed out. That's the birth of the church. There, and, and this is key. Yep. The church didn't give birth to him. He no. gives birth to the church. Yeah, and, and that's a great point because if we look at historically – only one figure gave birth to the male child that will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Who is that? That's Holy Mary. And what do we read towards the end? It tells you, this is mind-blowing. By the way, it tells you that serpent of old. So it's the serpent of Genesis 3. And then it says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Well, who are the rest of her children? They're the ones who keep the keep commandments. The She's the mother of the church. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that, Father. And this is um, very, very important that, of course, her offspring is Christ. Her seed is Christ. Yes, correct. But the rest of her offspring are all the, those who belong to Christ. Yes. And keep the commandments of Christ. And remember how Christ said in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yep. Those who love Jesus obey his commandments. And Satan is enraged and with the woman. And any Christians who find themselves in opposition mm -hmm. to Mary, need to just ask themselves. I think that they're trying to make sure that we stay faithful to Christ. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they put themselves at risk of being agents of Satan. Yeah. Who is enraged at her all the time. That enmity goes to Eve and continues through Our Lady to the end of the world. Yeah. And if Christians are enraged with her. They are putting themselves at that risk of siding with the evil one. Yeah. Don't do that. Love the Blessed Mother as Jesus loves her. Amen. And, you know, that devotion, I don't know about your neighborhood, but I suspect it wasn't the, too different. <laughs> we all showed great respect to our friends' moms. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Our friends' moms were almost like ants. They all kept an eye on us. They all conspired to make sure that uh, my mother told Mrs. Sika and Mrs. Pavin, if he acts up, smack him. You know, they had full permission. 
<laughs> and you know they never did because I always behaved with them. I I had great respect for my friends, and you never, ever gave an unkind word about any of your friends' moms. No, that you just don't do that. If you wouldn't do it for your friend's mom, don't do it to Jesus' mom. Just don't. Show her the respect that is due the one who carried Christ in her womb and let him be formed in her womb. And someone who can help us, you know, see the holiness and importance of a woman's womb, the sacredness, and that the child in there is not, you know, so I, I love it when these people say, you can't, don't tell me to be against abortion. Don't shove your religion down my throat. My response is, don't shove a knife down a baby's throat either. A defenseless baby. You're definitely yeah. right. Father, I want to say that you have been absolutely incredible as usual. I've been so edified, and I know the audience, by the time they this airs tomorrow evening, they'll be incredibly edified by this. I want to give you a moment to put in a plug for anything you want to put a plug in. Do you want to direct the audience to anything you may be working on? Web page, show, anything. The floor is yours right yeah. now. Here, here's the thing I would ask them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Protestant and Catholic alike. I wrote a book called Mary. Yeah. Virgin mother and queen a bible study for catholics i would you know i just so that you know i don't make a penny i have no idea what happens to the the royalties it goes to my order and yeah. we use it for the works of the church i don't want to sell this because i get anything from it yeah i want you to get this to enter into the sacred word of scripture and see what the word of God says about our lady and come to some of your own conclusions and enliven your relationship with our lady by finding her in the word of God. That is my goal. And that's, that's the one thing I would ask you to do. Get that Bible study and just be filled with the word of God and it, the wisdom we have about Our Lady. So that'd be it. And by the time this show airs tomorrow evening, there'll be a link right down there for people to be able to get a copy of that book. They can purchase it online. Father, thank you so much for your time. I've been incredibly edified. And I look forward to having you back on in the future. And if I may give you a blessing. Please do, Father. I'll be incredibly edified. And I know the whole audience will be as well. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, and thanks for doing the work you do.